today. And uh, I certainly want to do what God wants in this service. When I, when I think about how good God is, He can reach down and solve a problem, find a lost family member. <clears throat> I remember in Houston, uh, one day this lady had prayed through the Holy Ghost and she was weeping and I walked up to her and I said, uh, is there a problem? She said, yes, there is. She said, when Cambodia was overrun, uh, we were trying to get out and spare our lives. And uh, in the crowd and the push to get out from certain death, uh, she said, all of a sudden, my daughter, my little five-year-old, got a loose from me and I never found her and I said well and I, I started weeping I said I, I, I'm sorry I said but you know I'm serving a God who can reunite you with your daughter and we prayed and cried and that next week she was at a grocery store in Houston, Texas, and she saw this girl who was 17 years old. And she walked up to her and she called her by name. And the little girl looked at her and said, are, are you my mother? Sister Moderon was reunited with a daughter that had been lost for all of those years. It's not an accident. When God says he's going to do something, he knows how to do it. Sister Mataran uh, found some more Cambodians and brought one young man to church, and he prayed through the Holy Ghost. And, and uh, I said, uh, I understand you're from Cambodia also. He said, yes. He said, um, my father was the ruler of Cambodia. My Lord. He said, I was the only young person in Cambodia that had a Corvette. He said, but I had to run for my life. But he found his way to Irvington. And God filled him with the Holy Ghost. God's not short on his ability to do things. I don't know, what, what do they call those rulers in Cambodia? Anyway, he was the, what we call the president of the country. He was the supreme ruler of Cambodia. But uh, his son found the supreme ruler of the universe. <laughs> Oh, dear Lord, have mercy. Sometimes we get out of options. We don't know which way to turn or if we can, if, if there is any way that we can uh, ever find the hope that we need. But I'm telling you today, God wants to do that. Matter of fact, I believe tonight that whatever seems like an impossibility to you, God wants to show you that I can do it. I say God wants to show you that I can do it. Oh, Lord. In St. John chapter 5 and verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folks, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. 
For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. And whosoever then, first after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. And when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? And the impotent man answered him, saying, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth in down before me. And Jesus said unto him, Arise and take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up the bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. I, I, I want to talk to you tonight on the subject out of options. It doesn't matter how impossible that it seems for you tonight. I'm telling you, God is fixing to open up a channel, open up an opportunity. And what seemed like would never come to pass. God will do it. You can be seated. For the longest time, uh, this story didn't make any sense to me. It was about a man who had barely enough faith to stand on. But Jesus treated him as if he was a son off the altar. Martyrs, apostles deserve such honor, but some paupers who doesn't know Jesus when they see him are so I thought uh, I, I thought of the story to be too good to be true. The story is about an invalid in Jerusalem. The story is actually about me and it's about you. The fellow is nameless. He ha has a name. He has yours. He has a face. It's yours. He has a problem just like you do. But Jesus encountered this man near a large pool on the north side of the temple in Jerusalem. This pool was about 360 feet long, 130 feet wide, and 75 feet deep. Colonnades with porches overlooking this body of water. Its residents are people of sickness and disease without any options. It's called Bethesda. It could be called Central Park or Metropolitan Hospital or even Joe's Bar or Grill. It could be a homeless huddle beneath some overpass. It could be any collection of hurting people. In, in a revival that I was in, uh, nothing had happened. And I, I made a strong statement one night. I said, if you can't bring someone back tomorrow night, don't even come back. Just stay home. Because we're struggling to see a revival break. And, and you keep coming and enjoying the blessings of God. But there's thousands of people around you that's dying lost. If you can't bring someone tomorrow night, just stay home. And that was too strong. I, I know it was real strong. And uh, when I got back to church the next night, I, I wished I hadn't have said it because there was almost no one there. And I looked at the pastor and he said, you said it, Brother Bourne. And they took you at, at your word so they didn't come. But after a while, this, this man come into the service and he brought uh, a very strangly looking fellow with him and they come all the way up and sit on the front seat. I, I looked at him, I said, where in the world did you get that dude? He said, Brother Bourne, I, I heard what you said and I, I invited a number of people and none of them would come. And he said, so I, I went out to the freeway and I got to an overpass and I looked and this guy was bedding down for the night. 
And so I, I said, well, maybe he'll come. So I got out and walked up there, and I said, sir, would you like to go somewhere where it's warm, where we can have a lot of fun? And, man, it will be, it'll be a blast. He said, yeah, man, let's go. So he got in the car with me, and when I pulled up in front of the church, he said, this is a church. He said, you said we was going somewhere we could have fun. I said, you just wait. This is going to be the best night of your life. Oh, Lord, have mercy. And so I knew I had someone to preach to that night, and I aimed my sermon straight at him. When I got through preaching, he was weeping, and he stood up and turned around and knelt down at the front of the pew and started asking God to help him because he knew he needed help. He didn't have any options. After a while, he got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and we baptized him in Jesus' name. And he said, uh, while we were in the office after church, he, he was talking to Pastor and myself, and uh, he said, oh, I, I, I have a, uh, a sister living in uh, San Francisco. I, I wish she could find a church like this. And uh, he started weeping, and I, I asked him, Where, whereabouts, what did she do? She said, well, uh, her life is all messed up on drugs. She's a street walker, a prostitute, and she's probably walking along trying to find somebody to pick her up so she can make 10 or $15 for that little trip that she's looking for. And I, I started weeping. Pastor started weeping. And, and about that time, the telephone rang. And uh, there was a pastor from California. He says, I, I, I know this is going to be a hard question to ask you, but says, tonight, about an hour ago, which was two hours later than we were, or earlier than we were, so uh, here we were at... Uh, 9.30 in the office, and at 7.30 he called. He said, uh, we were having church and said this uh, street walker walked in and said uh, people were worshiping the Lord, and, and she started weeping, and she went to the altar, and God filled her with the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> oh, Lord. And said when she... Uh, finally uh, settled down a little bit. She says, you know, uh, I, I wish my brother could hear about this. She said, if he could just hear about this, he would be joyful just to get what I got tonight. And said, uh, we're, we're, we're looking for him. Do, do you know where we might could find anybody? He said, he's probably under a, a, a viaduct somewhere or under a, a overpass. And um, pastor said, uh, hold, hold on just a minute. He said, uh, what was his name? And when she said his name, he handed the phone to this guy. And uh, at the same identical time, while he was speaking in tongues, his sister all the way on the West Coast, God filled her with the Holy Ghost. And then for about 30 minutes, they just talked in tongues to each other, giving praise to the Almighty God. When you're out of options and you have no better place to do or go, God can step in and make all the difference in the world. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Boy, you, something broke that night. And it wasn't but a few weeks that some 60-something people had received the Holy Ghost. And uh, the church was filled to capacity. And, boy, God is still in that kind of business tonight. I say he's still in that kind of business. Boy, 
the next night, this, this guy walked in and he sat on the second pew. And uh, I got through preaching and he got up and started out the door. And he got to the door and I said, hey, buddy. And he turned around and he says, you talking to me? And I said, yeah. I said, don't, don't leave the building. He said, well, I, I've heard enough. I said, well, let me tell you, you walk through those doors and you'll die the moment you, the doors come back to. I said, now you take your choice. He said, man, you drive a hard bargain. <laughs> I said, well, go ahead. Just swing doors, just walk on through them. He said, he turned around and looked at me. He said, who do you think you are, God? I said, no, but I'm a man from God. And I, God gave me this message to give you, so you go ahead and walk out that door. Or you can make your trip down here to the altar and God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. Amen. So he stood there a moment and he turned and looked at the door and he turned and looked at me. And he walked down towards the altar and he got the Holy Ghost. That was Gordon Poe. Has Gordon Poe ever preached up here? Gordon Poe, he's been an evangelist now for several years, preaching the gospel. But had he walked through those doors, it would have been the end of the line, and he was out of options that night. The next night, he brought his three brothers, and they got the Holy Ghost. And they brought their sisters, and they got the Holy Ghost. And they brought their friends, and they got the Holy Ghost. Oh, Lord, have mercy. We don't have a lot of things that we can look forward to without God. You may have uh, a good bank account, but that will be gone in a few days when they change the money situation. And according to the Bible, we'll just throw our money in the street. It won't be any good anymore. Uh, we'll be out of options. And un unless we'll take the mark, uh, we can't buy nor sell. There'll be some that'll still be here. I hope that I'm one of the ones that's taken out of here before all of that happens. <laughs> and I'm believing that some way we're going to escape all of that kind of stuff. I don't want to be in a place where I, I have no options left because God is fixing to help us do what we think is an impossibility. You see, the picture is uh, a battleground strewn with wounded soldiers. And you see a Bethesda. Imagine a, a nursing home crowded and understaffed. And you see a pool. Then you look at this man who was laying there and had tried for 38 years. When, when do we give up? Some of you give up after one night. Some of you walk out of here and you'll say, well, I don't think I'll ever come back. You better watch where you're going because God has got something for you right here. And you don't need to be running across country to looking for some pie in the sky because God will take care of you right here. Can, can you picture it? Jesus walking along the suffering. What was he thinking? He he stepped over infected people and some was touching him on the leg and taking him by the hand and stumbling over blind people. And there were, there were many, many people along the borders of that pool. But one, when the Lord finally stopped and says, why don't you get in the pool? He said, I, I have no one to help me. I, I tried and I've tried for 38 years and and uh, I, I get almost to the water and someone puts their hand in it or puts their foot in it just ahead of me and they get the blessing and I don't. And the Lord looked at him and he said, what wilt thou have me do? That word wilt, boy, if you, if you look that up, it means before you can think, before you can say it. What wilt thou have me do? Oh, Lord. Let me ask, have you asked the Lord, wilt thou help me tonight? 
Maybe that ought to be the expression that you use because when you say, uh, wilt thou help me, the help is already there. Come on, you, you, you're not believing me. You see, if it's God's plan, God is the standard for perfection. The goal is to be like him, and anything less than that is inadequate. But you see, uh, it's you and me lying on the ground. When he comes uh, to the healing of spiritual conditions, most of us don't stand a chance. But some way, God's got to help us. If God could talk to a man that, uh, I, don't, I don't remember if I mentioned this this morning, but uh, I, I was in this service and there was a man sitting on the front seat on the end, right where that lady is sitting. And uh, it was my first service there and I didn't know that person or very many other people that was in that church. And, and I looked at him and I said, sir. All God wants out of you is a response. And he, he looked at me and he, he didn't stand up. He just sat there and I said, uh, I, I'm not telling you to get up and run, which that's what I'd rather tell you. But if you just stand up and raise your hands and give God a chance, God would erase everything that you're facing tomorrow. And he said, I can't do it. I said, sure you can. Just stand up and lift your hands like that. That's, that's a simple thing. What, what was happening, he was facing a court-martial in Biloxi, Mississippi at Keesler Air Force Base. He was an officer in the Air Force, and he had made some mistakes. And uh, his sentence was to be 25 years at Leavenworth. And he was facing a dark hour. And I didn't know that, but I said, if you just stand up and give God praise, God would deliver you. But he thought he was out of options. Uh, there's nothing I can do. Uh, after church, I, the pastor told me, said, Brother Bourne, uh, I, I wish that man had responded because he's facing court martial in the morning at Keesler Air Force Base. And so... The next morning, uh, he, he went to that court-martial, and that colonel in the Air Force looked at him, and he says, um, I've, I've got your uh, freedom right here in my hand. Last night about 8.30, I sat down at the typewriter, and I typed up your freedom. I've decided that I'm going to let you go, and here it is. But when I look in your eyes, I see rebellion. Oh, my God. That colonel says, because of that rebellion I see in your eyes, and he took that paper that he had typed up that would give him freedom from those 25 years at Leavenworth and ripped it up in front of him. He says, take him out. And I don't want one good time day given to him. I want him to serve all 25 years. He was a man that had received the Holy Ghost. But he wouldn't respond when he was asked to. And all of a sudden, he's out of options. Oh, dear Lord. And, and sometimes we, we come to a service and... God wants a response out of you. And, and, and I know you don't have to get up and run. Of course, that might help. You don't have to dance, but that might help. I mean, you don't have to talk in tongues, but it would help. Uh, my Lord, have mercy. Forget about the people around you and what they may think, and they might know some fault that you made and think that you don't stand a chance. But response to the Almighty God in the moment of trouble, God will set you free. Oh, Lord. 
Are, are you an invalid without options? Are, are you here with no hope for tomorrow? Hallelujah. Have you got a notice from the bank that they're repossessing your car? You're fixing to lose your house? Oh, Lord. I, I was preaching in Dayton, Ohio, and one night I, I, I told this couple, I said, if, if you worship God, God will change everything that you're facing. And this man stood up and he said, Sir, uh, we had lost our job, and as a result of that, we lost our house, and we had to move out and uh, we we're struggling to even find a place to live right now. And I, I said, sir, if you and your wife will get up and dance around this church. I said, uh, from today, you've already filed bankruptcy, so you know you're in trouble there. But if you will get up and dance around this church as a response to just a call from the pulpit. I said, God will change that. And 40 days from today, circle that on your calendar, sir. 40 days from today, you go out and look for a house. And God's going to erase that bankruptcy. Oh, Lord. I, I, I talked to Brother Smith the other day, and I, I asked him, uh, Brother Smith, did that happen? He said, on day 39, they have not found a house. He said, you know what Brother Bourne told you on the 40th day. So they went out looking again, and they found this house, and uh, they knew their credit was gone because they had filed bankruptcy. And Brother Smith uh, said, uh, if you all will just go in and go through the, what have you got to do? And they signed up that day, the 39th day, and their credit God erased everything on it, and they qualified for that home. Oh, Lord. Oh, dear Lord, have mercy. I'm talking about when you're out of options, you're willing to do whatever you can do. So right now, it's not uh, how fast you can run down the street. It's, it's not... Uh, some Olympic thing that you can get involved in or some swimming competition, but it's, it's giving praise to the Almighty God. And when you have done everything you can do, sometimes you just got to get up and say, God, here I am. You got to help me. Uh, we, can, we can look at Jonah in the fish's belly. He, he, he didn't have an option. That fish had swallowed him. And went down into the depths of the sea, the Bible says. Uh, I, I tried to look up how deep that sea was. And uh, if it was over 100 foot deep, uh, you can't go that deep. But if I understood it right, it was probably 2,000 feet deep. And that fish went down to the depths of the sea and settled down there for three days and three nights. And Jonah... He said, God, uh, if you will deliver me from this, I'll go to Nineveh and I'll preach the word. And I won't spare anything that you tell me to say. I will get out of here and I'll, if you'll just let me out. Well, can, can you imagine being in the, in the in a fish that God prepared and swallowed you up and take you down to the depths of the sea and seaweed wrapped around your neck? And all of a sudden, that fish belched, and his belly began to move, and he come off the bottom and, and vomited him up on dry land. He didn't wait to go down to Sears and buy him a new suit. He took off a running. Nineveh was the largest city in the world at that time. History says that 125,000 babies was born in one night. That's how big it was. It took him four days to run through the city screaming, yet 40 days and God will destroy this city. 
Yet 40 days. Four days running across it. And then up to the hill he went. You know, he, he blew it as a preacher. He was a flop as a fugitive. He was, at best, he was a coward, and at worst, he was a traitor because God told him to do something, and he wasn't about to do it because it seemed like an impossible situation. If God tells you that he's going to help you, you need to get up and start praising him. And since, since God has me here for tonight, and I can tell you that God's going to help you, then you ought to give praise to the Lord. Because God's going to do it. Yes, God's going to do it. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh. If, if, if I might use a personal reference without you think I'm trying to be a smart aleck because really I'm not. Because as, as, as a young man, uh, when God told me to do something, I tried to do it. I, I, I bought and give away uh, 14 vehicles. Preacher come along, they were in trouble, and I'd buy a car and I'd give it to them. I didn't have the money to buy a brand new one, but I bought the best I could buy. And I, 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 I give away 14 vehicles. My wife one day said, Daddy, how long are we going to give away cars when we need one ourselves? And I'd, I'd get a car, and it would be a pretty good car, and someone come along, and the Lord said, Just give that to that fellow. He needs it worse than you. And then in 1996, the tide changed. Since 1996, I haven't had to buy a car, and now I'm driving 19th one in a row. That was just the title, and the keys was given to me. Since 96. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I have to give God praise. Oh, Lord. He canceled the debt which listed all the rules that we are failures of. He paid for it and he forgave us. And sometimes even in advance, he says, I knew you was going to make that mistake. But if you will just call on my name, I'll be there to help you. And in the middle of the night, God will meet you and he will take care of what you thought was a total impossibility. <sighs> Daniel was thrown in the lion's den. His prospects were not any better than Jonah's were. Because Jonah was swallowed and Daniel was about to be. Because those lions, they only left the bones around. But they threw the wrong man in because he believed that God was going to help him. And when he landed down there, those lions looked at him and says, no, 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 no. No, we're not going to eat this one. There's something about this one's different than the rest of those guys they threw in here. Oh, hallelujah. Joseph was trapped without an option. Uh, no exit, no hope, sold to a band of gypsies. Uh, he was promised as a child, and he, he told his brothers, he said, I, I saw these uh, sheaves standing up, and one 
uh, one would stand up and others bowed down to him. And they said, what are you trying to say? Y'all going to, that we're going to have to bow down to you? He said, well, that's what it looks like, boys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. And after he spent 18 years in prison for something he didn't do, after he was sold to a bunch of uh, Egyptians that were traveling, uh, actually they were uh, more like, uh, what, do you, what do you call them? gypsies but he changed history he was wise enough to give them what they asked for and not what they deserved when God raised him out of that prison and he was standing as third in command of all the nation and those brothers came and when they he looked at him and he spoke in the Egyptian tongue and they didn't understand, and someone interpreted for him while he could speak fluent Hebrew. And when he looked at them, and he said to them, he sent all the other guys out, and in this room he looked at him. he says, uh, boys, y'all know who I am? And they, they looked at him and said, no. He said, I am Joseph whom you sold into slavery. And they bowed down before him, thinking that was the end of the line. But instead of taking their lives, he gave them Goshen. <laughs> that was going to be their savior because God was going to bring them out of that terrifying part of the country. Barabbas was left in prison uh, it looked like there was nothing that, that could happen for him. Nothing. Uh, but all of a sudden, someone said, uh, uh, re release him. I'll take his place. Yeah. Oh, Lord. When Jesus tells us to stand, let's stand. When he tells us we're forgiven, let's unload the guilt. When he tells us we're valuable, let's believe him. When he says that uh, we're eternal, let's bury our face in fear. When he says that we're provided for, let's stop worrying. When he says stand up, let's do it. When he says worship me, don't you worry about you might interrupt a sermon. It's time to worship the Lord, so then it's time to do it. When God says for you to throw the plate back and fast for me three or four days, you don't know what God's fixing to lead you in or who he's fixing to lead out. Oh, hallelujah. There might be a family member of yours who has, has sworn by their blood that they would never bow down. But your response tonight could change that. And before you leave this service tonight, wherever they are, they could find a church somewhere and bow on their knees. And when they call you after church and tell you, hey, I got that same experience that you've been talking about for all these years. Oh, hallelujah. We are not out of options. We are not out of options. Oh, hallelujah. Uh, I, I read this story, and I, I'm going to close with this. Uh, it was a story about a private. Uh, Napoleon's horse run away. And this guy took off after that horse and caught him and brought him back to Napoleon. And when he handed the horse back to him, Napoleon said these words, Thank you, Captain. With one word, this private was promoted. When the emperor said it, the private believed it. He went to the quartermaster and he selected a new uniform and he put it on. He went to the officer's quarters and selected a bunk and that's where he was going to sleep that night. He went to the officer's mess and he had a meal. Because the emperor said it, he believed it. I would that we would believe that God will help you before you get home, if in faith you responded to such a degree 
that nothing could be withheld from you, you could get what you ask for or even... What wilt thou have me do? What wilt thou have me do? i tell you what. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Right now, God can do anything. That daughter or that son that is wayward and you think could never get back, God could bring them back in. And if God forgives them, who am I to commend any kind of sentence against them? If God wants to set you free, who am I to put a chain on you and say you can't make it? You can. Oh, hallelujah. I mentioned this morning about uh, my wife being sick. My wife, 18 years ago, had cancer, and she was going down, 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 and it looked like it. There was no hope for her. But God stepped in. And when the doctor says she wouldn't live, she did. And when he said, I would never talk again, I do. And, and when MD Anderson says he won't live to morning, I did. And that was three years ago, and I'm still going. Hallelujah. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but tonight I know what God done for me three years ago. Oh, hallelujah. And I'm telling you, God can set you free. And before you walk out of this building, he can unleash or take the cap off or to remove the things that's got you hindered financially and you can succeed. Oh, Lord. And when I, when I, when I think about that, Oh, Lord. This, let, 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 let me tell this and then I'll, I'll get out of the way. This, this guy come to church and got the Holy Ghost. And his wife threw a rod. She said, um, I'm not going to live with anybody that goes to that church. And the unfortunate thing was she was the boss where he worked. And so the next day she fired him. That was a bad deal. He come to me and said, what do I do, Brother Bourne? I said, well, that choice is up to you. If you want to go back, recant, that's up to you. But if you will hold on. I said, matter of fact, if you will stay put and not do anything until God gives me instructions for you. He'll give instructions. I don't know how long it'll be. And it was a year. He found a job. Didn't make enough. He, he found a house. Uh, he rented a house and didn't have one stick of furniture. Not one chair, not one table, not one sheet, not one pillowcase, not one washcloth or towel. And he slept on the floor for one year. The job that he had, he didn't have a car, and so I give him a car. And he drove the wheels off of it. After a year, he come to me and said, Brother Bourne, how long do I have to live like this? I said, until God talks to me. Are you willing to take the sacrifice? And he said, well, I've made it a year. I guess I can make it another one. And then I told him that week, I said, 
God just told me what you to do. And if you'll follow my instructions, God will help you. My Lord. Some people don't believe that the preacher has any right to say over what they do, but uh, he believed me. And uh, I said, this is what you need to do. He says, Brother Bourne, I've never done that. I don't know if I can even qualify for that. I said, sure you can. Because you've been faithful. And so I give him instructions, and he done it, and he prospered. And his wife, his former wife, lost her job, and he hired her so he could fire her. <laughs> I told him, I said, be careful. <laughs> and in one year, this don't seem possible, but in one year he made $40 million dollars. He said, someone wants to buy my company. I said, well, that's up to you. You sell it, but if you do, you'll make a bad mistake. You know, if I made $40 million a year, I don't think I'd be ready to sell. God blesses me tonight. I won't give up tomorrow either. <laughs> and your response a while ago was just the tip of the iceberg. Because... God is fixing to show you just how big he is. Oh, dear Lord, dear Lord, dear Lord. And, and, and if God could do it in the past, Jesus walked up to this guy and he says, why don't you get in the pool? He said, I, I, I tried for 38 years, and I didn't make it. And the Lord looked at him and said, what wilt thou have me do? Oh, hallelujah. And when he responded to the Lord, the Lord says, arise and take up thy bed and walk. He didn't have to go down in the water just to get his healing. All he had to do was stand on his limp feet that he could not walk on, raise his hands that he couldn't get above his head, find him a job that he could work and make a living because God healed him. What wilt thou have God do for you? I'm telling you, God's fixing to do it for somebody. And everybody won't get this, but some's going to get it. Psalm's going to get it. Oh, hallelujah. We are not out of options. I say we're not out of options. would do something for me according to my response to him boy it'd be a hard time to get you to shut me up
wave that hand, Sister Singletary. God's fixing to do something for you. Give it all you got, sir. And watch God open up the windows of heaven and dump you out a blessing that you can't even contain. Oh, Lord, I'm going to have mine. I'm going to have mine. 